If you haven't already, uh, if you go look online, um, there's something called a, a phase A review. And uh, it's huge, it's like 17 pages or something, isn't it? And it has uh, basically a summary of every class that we've done, all the key points, in addition to uh, a list of all the practices, and they even did a little glossary kind of thing. So it's, it's a great way of um, uh, taking everything we've done so far and summarizing it, because today is really the last class of phase A, and then we start phase B, which really isn't any different in that it's the same day. It's still going to be me, unfortunately. You have to put up with me in, uh, until you get to phase C. Um, but we'll notice that when we get into phase B, the shift starts to go into some more deeper things. We talk a lot more about astral projection and that kind of stuff. Um, so as a review today, we're just going to look at uh, uh, intuition, the sense of intuition, talk a little bit about it, define what it is, look at some practices that we can use to develop intuition, and we're going to have a look at some of the difficult eagles and the problems that they cause. Uh, this is a really interesting quote. Frustration, fear, doubt, and guilt all cause anger. Whoever liberates himself, herself, themselves, from these four negative emotions will dominate the world. And in the end, uh, we'll see that, that anger is a, is a real problem uh, in our psychology and obviously in society as a whole, right? Um, there's a lot of pain and, and suffering that's caused as a result of anger. And anger is a difficult one to put your finger on because there's all kinds of things that can cause anger. Just being angry, when we self-observe, we discover sometimes we get angry because of guilt. We get angry because of fear. We get angry because of frustra frustration. We get angry because of the elevated sense of self and self-importance. There's a lot of things that kind of end up triggering the ego of anger. And the anger itself brings a lot of consequences karmically, because when we lash out of anger, we tend to do a lot of destructive things. We hurt other people. Um, all kinds of things result as a, a consequence of anger, and we'll look at that today. Uh, so let's start off by talking about intuition. Uh, if we were to, to define intuition, we will talk about intuition, but intuition is the sense where information comes to us through channels other than the mind and the five senses. Everything that we understand about the world that we're in, everything that we have, be it, a, be it a memory or some knowledge or something, usually comes to us through the five senses. So we hear things, we see things, we taste, touch, smell, all that kind of stuff. We gather all this information through the five senses, and it kind of arrives at the mind, the intellectual center, where it's interpreted, that sort of thing. Okay, the sense of intuition is where we receive information through a channel other than the mind and the five senses. It almost arrives at us from a different place. And that's why the sense of intuition is um, so easily overridden by the mind. It's such a confusing thing to understand because we have this information that reaches us, but we don't really know where it comes from. It's, interestingly enough though, one of several psychic faculties that can be developed with practices. Everybody has intuition to a certain extent, but it's something that we can learn to pay a lot more attention to and start to use more practically uh, when we develop it. So everybody has a, a latent sense of, of intuition to begin with, but it's something that we can learn to develop over time. There's very specific practices that we can use to develop the sense of intuition. Okay? And one of the interesting aspects about intuition is when we start to, to pay attention to it, when we start to focus it, uh, the more it starts to work. It's almost like a sense that we haven't really used too much. In that sense, it almost becomes atrophy. But once we start to exercise it, once we start to utilize it, then it's something that we can uh, definitely get a lot more control over. When we experience intuition, what's happening is information is reaching us from the spiritual part of ourselves, basically the higher self in the higher dimensions, if you look at it that way. Okay, so we have a connection. We've talked about this before. We have a connection with another side of ourselves. Okay, we could think of it, you know, you could call it the spiritual side, you could call it your higher self, you could call it your true self, you could call it your soul, your essence, your bodhisattva, whatever, it all basically means the same thing. Okay, so we have a connection with that side of ourselves, and sometimes there's communication that occurs there. Okay, we've talked about this before in different aspects. So I think I used the example of, you know, you're walking home late at night, it's, you know, it's cold, it's snowy and you could take the shortcut through the alley and you go to turn down the alley and something in your gut tells you that that's not the right thing to do, okay? That's a sense of communication that comes from the higher self. Remembering that the higher self is basically existing in a much higher dimension. Things happen in the higher dimensions first and then crystallize down. So your higher self from that much higher vantage point is able to see the consequence of the actions. 
So your higher self is able to see, well, if you, you know, turn around that corner and go down the alley, perhaps there's some trouble waiting for you down there. You can almost imagine the higher self is literally being able to see things from a much higher vantage point and being able to see what's coming around the corner time-wise. Okay, and that's why the higher self can say, you know, it's a really bad idea that you turn down that corner right now. It's able to see things before they happen just because of the space it occupies dimensionally. So a much higher point than the regular intellectual center, the physical body and the five senses. Remembering that the key thing to understand in the higher dimensions, things happen first and then crystallize here. Remember one of the interesting things when we look at uh, the structure of things dimensionally, you've got the three dimensions that exist before us, length, width, and height. You've got the fourth dimension flowing through those, which is time. All the other dimensions, the fifth and the sixth and the seventh, they exist outside of time. Okay, and when we go as high as the Kelso world, the world of cause and effect, we're able to see action and consequence long before it happens, giving the higher self a completely different vantage point. So things happen in the higher dimensions first, and then crystallize down to the physical. Therefore, it's possible with intuition, and this is where most people, your average person, encounters the sense of intuition, we usually get warnings about events before they happen. Okay, kind of that, that gut reaction. And, you know, sometimes people get this a lot. There are people that, you know, might not even be able to describe it in a spiritual context, talking about different dimensions, but they know it. They say, I trust my instincts. I go with my gut. There's people that just operate like that because throughout their life, they've learned to trust that. Okay? One of the harder things for the intellectual person is to go with instinct and trust gut because we rely so much on reason and logic. That's the difficult thing with intuition. We don't know where the information comes from. We can't explain why we feel that way. Okay? So we use that example again. We're going to turn down the dark alley and we get that sense, don't do that, it's bad. But then the mind intercedes that. And it uses reason and logic and says, yeah, but it's quicker to go down the alley. It's dark, it's cold, it's snowy, I'll get home faster. I think according to logic and reason, it's better than I go down the alley. Or sorry, better that I go down the alley. Okay, so in many situations, intellect and reason override intuition. But we have to remember intuition comes from a much higher source. It basically supersedes reason and logic. Reason and logic are tools that the intellectual center uses based on information it gathers through the five senses. The problem with the intellectual center, as we know, is it's usually a tool that's used by the ego. Okay, the ego relies quite heavily on reason and logic, and that uh, identification with the ego tends to shut out or choke that sense of intuition. Most people have some degree of intuition, and most people have experienced it before. This is something that we've all encountered in our life at various times. Usually you get the sense of intuition, ignore it, do the wrong thing, and go, why didn't I go with my first response? Why didn't I trust my gut? Why didn't I go with my first instinct? But most people don't actively develop it. And as we mentioned earlier, it's something that can be developed. It's something that we can learn to use in our practical life. And most people as well, they don't even pay attention to the sense of intuition. Because it's hard to describe. It's just, it's a feeling. It's a knowledge that we have that isn't a memory. It doesn't come from reason and logic. We didn't gather it through our five senses. It's not that we saw something. It's not that we heard something. It's not, it's just there. It's just the sense that we have that there's going to be a certain outcome or that we should, we should do a particular action. The mind is the main problem when we look at the whole concept of intuition. The intuitive hunch, if you want to call it that, that comes from our higher self. That comes from the connection that we have in the higher dimensions. But when it reaches the physical world, the mind intervenes and overrides that sense of intuition. We rely so heavily on the mind that it's easier for us to, to identify with the mind than it is to identify with this strange sense. And sometimes intuition is referred to as one of the six senses. Okay, we've got the five senses obviously, but there's even, you've probably heard before talk of six, seven, and even higher senses. This represents one of the higher senses that we don't really spend a, a lot of time paying attention to, but it's one that we can develop. Um, that's also known as second guessing yourself, right? How many times have you done this when you realize you should have gone with your first hunch? But the problem is it's hard to really define what that is because it's not a memory. It's not something we saw. It's not something that we heard. It's not something that arrived through the mechanisms of reason and logic. It's just a sensation that we have that we should do X, Y, or Z and, and not anything else. The important thing to remember is reasoning destroys the sense of intuition. 
reasoning severs that connection that we have with our higher self. So if we go back to that analogy about turning that, the corner and going down that dark alley, the gut, the hunch, the communication from a higher self says don't do that because it's able to perceive what the outcome of that will be. Perhaps there's a, you know, something bad waiting for us around the corner, we get robbed or mugged or whatever. But it's the sense of reasoning that says, well, it's shorter, it's faster, it's dark outside, it's cold, I'll get home quicker. And as soon as we identify with the mind in that point, as soon as we identify with the intellectual center, that turns off the communication with our higher self. It's like literally turning the tap off. The more time we spend focusing on tuition and developing this, it's like opening that tap. It's like opening that conduit, that channel we have for communication with the higher self. The more we open that channel, the more information starts to flow. The more we start seeing intuition appear in many different aspects of our lives. For your average person, it's usually just, a, a, I don't use the term life or death situations, but it's usually something significant like that. You don't see intuition playing a regular part in your life. But the more you start practicing with it, the more you start developing it, the more you start to know and are able to actually perceive the sense of intuition and separate that sense from simple reasoning and logic. And consequently then, intuition is a valuable sense that we want to develop. It's something that we want to work with because it's literally communication with our higher self. And walking any spiritual path, a path that leads to the awakening of a consciousness, is just that, incarnating or embodying our higher self, opening up all those channels that we have to our higher self so we're able to experience that directly. Intuition is not only used in day-to-day -day life, like deciding whether or not we should go down dark alleys, but intuition also helps us in various aspects of our spiritual path as well. For example, intuition helps us with the interpretation of symbols and teachings that we receive in dreams in the astral world. When we start astral, uh, ex having astral experiences and we start working with astral projection, things aren't always spelt out for us. Things aren't always given to us, you know, it's not always a clear and, and legible on a blackboard like this, for example. Many times the experiences that we have on the esoteric path, they're symbolic, okay? Sometimes they're images, sometimes they're symbols, sometimes we could find ourselves expressing things through paintings or drawings or whatever. We have to use the sense of intuition to understand what's happening. A lot of these symbols are meant to be grasped intuitively. It's no uh, coincidence that a lot of the world's great spiritual books, things like simple, things like the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the Popol Vuh, the Quran, a lot of the world's great religions, those books are written that way for a reason. They weren't meant to be taken literally. They're all kind of designed to be fable and parable and allegory, to bypass the intellect and speak directly to the consciousness. We should be using intuition to grasp the meanings of these things. And we've talked about this before. That's why those books were really not meant to be read like a novel from cover to cover, but a section of it read and then meditated on. And we use meditation to get to the root because meditation, of course, activates the consciousness, activates that sense of intuition. And we can then use that to interpret the teachings. Even our own dreams, we know we, we don't take our dreams literally. That's why when you're keeping your dream diaries, which I'm sure everyone's doing, of course, right? When you're writing down your dream diary, uh, one of the interesting things that you can do is just write down your gut reaction. No matter what it is, you can have a, a dream about, I don't know, a, a sunshine and flowers and rainbows, but if your gut reaction is fear, write that down. Because then when you go back and have a look at your dreams and you start working with your own dreams, you can start then figuring out what your own symbols are instead of going to, you know, um, uh, like chapters and buying a book on dream symbols. You can actually learn to interpret your own using the sense of intuition because the images in your dreams are communication or messages from your higher self. Okay, and of course we need a sense of intuition to grasp those, not reason and logic. If uh, you, most people obviously can relate to this, your dreams are random and haphazard and full of all kinds of strange symbols and nothing really flows together and they're all disjointed. There's a reason for that, and that's why we need intuition. Okay, so remembering that most symbols and dreams don't make sense to the mind, but the meaning can be intuitively captured. The messages from the higher self, that's how they come to us. Okay, they're not meant to be taken um, literally. They're meant to speak to us on a different level, speak to us through the course of intuition. Okay, so when we're writing down our dreams and interpreting the experiences that we have in the astral world, you have to use a sense of intuition as well. 
Okay, especially with the astral experiences, because you can get put in different scenes and different experiences in the astral for you to learn something. Okay, and you have to really rely a lot on the sense of intuition, which is why it's something that we want to actively develop so we can start to trust it. Yes? But then again, there are archetypes for the whole collective consciousness that are seen the same, mm -hmm. like throughout the ages, and mm -hmm. stuff, regardless of your emotional interpretation. Yeah, there's some consistencies, like for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even looking at something like as simple as a, a, one of the tarot cards, when we're working with those, we still need this a lot. Those images are written to communicate to the higher sense. To somebody else, it's like, so you've got a woman pulling open the jaws of a lion. Well, what does that mean? You're going to be a lion, lion tamer when you grow up? No, we have to use the sense of intuition. That's why those images are very specific the way they are. They bypass the intellect and speak to that particular level. So yeah, even when you look at things like archetypes, that's the same thing. It's bypassing the intellect, and these are universal symbols because this is where they go to. And that's kind of a, a collective part of all of humanity. We all possess the higher self. And we can bypass the intellect and interpretation and memories and prejudices and cultural biases and all that kind of stuff and get to the same meaning. So it's all, all still relating to intuition. Uh, as you progress in the work on, on the path, your intuition will develop and you'll be able to grasp more and more meaning as you cultivate a connection and communication with your higher self. Okay, it's something just, you know, like everything else that we look at, it's something that takes practice. It's something that takes a lot of sense um, that we need to develop. And the more we develop our intuition, the more we're able to actually understand. Okay, the more of our astral experiences we're able to understand, the more we start learning. Uh, when we read books by, by the masters or some of the world's great books, the more we're able to understand what's happening. So the more we learn, the, you know, the, the faster we learn as well. And remember, the whole time we're dealing with intuition, we're working to cultivate that connection and communication with our higher self. That's why part of the meditations that we do is working with that archetypal image of the Divine Mother, the Divine Mother representing that symbolic point of connection with our higher self. Okay? That's why, too, sometimes in meditation, one of the goals is to quiet the mind so the higher self can speak. That's basically a form of intuition. Okay? We used the example before about the small child in the room that we can't hear because a hundred other people are screaming. By turning off the intellectual center and quieting the mind, we can turn our attention to the small child. The small child represents basically the sense of intuition, the sense of communication with our higher self. That's why, too, if we have a, a specific challenge or an obstacle in our life, we're having a, a, we don't know what to do, um, something that can be a benefit is to go into a meditation with the sole purpose of trying to find an answer, which doesn't mean focusing on the problem or the, the, the obstacle. It means going to meditation to quiet the mind. And sometimes what we do is come out of the meditation, and there's now a sense of intuition of how to approach the problem. It's not that we go into meditation and spend the whole time thinking about the problem. It's the opposite. We go into a meditation, perhaps direct a prayer to our Divine Mother to help us find the answer to the problem, and then quiet the mind so we can get the response. There's so many times that voice is trying to talk to us, but we can't hear it from all the other voices in the room. Okay, And that's why if we're facing an obstacle or challenge in our life and we're not really sure you know, what path to go, we just you know, have to ask. But in order to hear the answer, we have to learn to quiet the mind, to turn off everybody else in the room. Uh, intuition can help us capture the reality of truth and the teachings. Intuition allows you to know in a specific and direct way what the intellect does not know. That's the problem with the intellect. The intellect can only use information it gathers through the five senses. The five senses are only tuned into the three dimensions we see before us. So using the mind, logic, and reason to understand spiritual concepts, to understand things from outside of these three dimensions, doesn't really make any sense. Because the only way we really grasp or understand something is by using the five senses. The five senses really only are tuned to the physical world. And that's the problem. Okay, that's why to really understand something like astral projection, you can read books until you're blue in the face, but it's not until you actually go there and, and do it and experience it yourself that you can get anything of value from it. Okay, that sense of intuition, it allows us to gather information in, in a really specific and direct way that the <coughs> intellect can never grasp. Some of the things that we're looking for, you know, like truth and that kind of stuff that we're, we're searching for, the intellect is never going to be able to grasp those. Yeah. And uh, just to follow up on that very point, 
Um, I've been um, interested for years and years in in uh, mediumship and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, and I consulted many psychics and that sort of thing until this summer I took a mediumship course myself and was able to, through the exercises that we did, um, give information that caused me to uh, say, wow, this is amazing. And so you know, it's the actual experience, as you mm -hmm. quite well pointed out, that uh, is far more meaningful than uh, theoretical uh, reading on the topic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that's often said, using the intellect to grasp spiritual teachings is like using a microscope to look at the stars. It's, it's the wrong tool. It's, it's not the right purpose. Okay, so intuition allows it to know in a specific and direct way. Okay, it's, it's, it's a specific and direct knowledge. The reason that it's, it's confusing is because it doesn't come through the intellect and it doesn't come through the five senses. Yeah? Something I find really hard sometimes is to go with the fear something and you think it's your intuition mm -hmm. or you want something so bad and you think it's your intuition and sometimes it's hard to draw the line when like uh, I don't know someone you really love is going on a trip and you think that there's going to be a plane mm -hmm. crash for example and you think it's your intuition but it's really your fear is there like a way because they both really come from you, yeah you're, you're not going to like the answer what's the answer self-inspection self-observation self -inspection. <laughs> Yeah, remember that's the one that I keep mentioning, get sick of hearing. Yeah, that's why we talked, and that's why the whole important aspect of really phase A we're in right now is self-observation, because we have to start to learn for ourselves what's the difference between something like the ego of fear generating a, a reaction or intuition. And that's really where self-observation comes in, because we can learn to separate the difference between the voice of our consciousness versus the voice of all these many egos. And just the way you described it there, you know, somebody that's close to us is going on a, on a vacation, we're afraid that something's going to happen to them on the plane. Well, what is that? Is that sense of intuition? Because that might be a very real possibility. Or is it an ego that's generated fear as a result of, you know, some sort of abandonment or childhood issues or whatever? Um, there's no easy answer to that. That's why we talk so much about self-observation, so we can learn for ourselves how to delineate between those two. Okay, that's why when self-observation, we split ourselves into the observer and observed to try to gain that different vantage point. And that's why, hopefully, if we've been trying to remember to do that a couple times each day, to self-observe. Okay, I remember we tried to associate the act of self-observation with doing something that we would do on a regular basis, like walking in and out of a room, tying our shoes, washing the dishes, having a shower, going to the bathroom, some sort of a regular event we do throughout the day that we can associate with the self-observation. Because self-observation is like a workout for the consciousness. The more we work it out, the bigger it becomes. The bigger it becomes, the more we can understand how that voice differs from fear, from anger, jealousy, lust, envy, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's some very specific mantras, practices that uh, we can use to develop intuition. Uh, we've done this one before, just the mantra O. Remember the mantra O? What shocker did that one activate again? The part. Yeah, that's the one for the heart chakra. The heart is seen, I mean, remember when we looked at the, let's say, the Egyptian culture. Okay, what do the Egyptians do to a brain? Nothing. They stuck a wire up there and mished it all up so the brain would fall out because the brain wasn't important. But the heart, the heart was actually preserved. And a lot of the world's religions, and especially uh, some of the primitive cultures, the heart was the seat of the soul, right? The heart was the important one. The heart was the seat of the soul because the heart chakra is the point of connection with our higher self. Okay, you could think of the heart chakra as the uh, walkie-talkie, the point of communication between us and our higher self. Using a mantra like, oh, of course, develops the heart chakra, the stronger and more tuned the heart chakra becomes, then consequently the greater the sense of intuition as well. Those are related. Okay, so it's not unusual to be working with this particular um, chakra or working with a mantra that includes this chakra that we can come out of our practice with, with a sense about something in our life, with that sense of intuition activated. Uh, this is one that we're, I think we're actually going to do today. This is a Tibetan one, Om Masi Padme Yom, and the translation for that is, Oh my God is in me. Okay, think of my God being my higher self, and that's found inside me. Okay, so Oh my God is in me. Uh, Padme is lowercase because these are mantralized, so that the vowel sounds are elongated like we usually do, but the Padme is just pronounced Padme, as opposed to Om and then Ma. 
across a, this is just simple pod net. That's why I've drawn that one lowercase. And that's a Tibetan one, oh my God is in me. And that's basically a way of giving, if you want to think of it as a, a reverence or connection to the God inside all of us, the God inside all of us, of course, being the divine spark, our, our higher self. And the mantra Trin, okay, that one also can be used to, to activate the sense of intuition. Once again, it doesn't matter which one, right? They all do the same thing. It is, you know, if you don't like this one and you want to do that one, you don't like that one, you want to do that one, it doesn't matter. Okay, in the end we show dozens of different practices many times for the same result, the idea, that, the idea being that you'll find one that you like. I don't like that one. Why? I don't know. Okay, this one I really like, but it, it's a personal thing. Okay, we give you all these different practices so you can find one that you like. Okay, remember when we were posed with different practices, the idea being you might go home and try it a couple times and then say, eh, I don't think that one's for me, I really didn't feel anything from that one. And then try another one and go, hey, I think that one worked or something happened during that one. And then that's the one you can stick with. Yes? Uh, so for example, if, if the O uh, mantra represents the heart chakra, mm -hmm. would that mean that intuition is developed in the heart chakra? Uh, basically, yeah, yeah, they're, they're related. Okay, so the heart, the activity, the energy of the heart chakra, that's basically our connection that we have with the higher self. The stronger the heart chakra becomes, the stronger that connection becomes in our higher self. And that's why, too, remember um, when we do the meditations, we always start off with the visualization, we always go into our heart, right, into that temple of our heart to talk to our Divine Mother. The Divine Mother just representing that arch archetypal. Um, connection or representation of our higher self and going into the heart is symbolic of the heart chakra going into that, that particular energy center. Yeah. When we talk about intuition, are we talking about uh, just receiving uh, messages or are we talking uh, clairvoyance, uh, clairaudience, hearing entities? Well, or? usually clairvoyance and clairaudience, they're related just to like we have our eyes and ears of the physical body and these are senses which are tuned to the three dimensions around us. Uh, when we go into altered states of consciousness, we can tune the sense of vision to perceive images of the higher dimensions, and we can tune the sense of hearing to perceive sounds of higher dimensions. So they're not uh, intuition as such, they're just becoming more attentive to the presence of the other dimensions around us. We can think of it that way. Uh, the intuition can sometimes come to us in a symbolic form as well. It doesn't have to be a hunch or something like that. It could be an image. For example, you could be doing a meditation that's activating that sense of clairvoyance and you could, could suddenly perceive a scene or an image or a symbol. Okay, you then have to use intuition to grasp well, what was the meaning of that? Why was I shown this? Why did I see that particular image? What meaning does that have for me in my day-to-day -day life or my point of where I am on this broken journey or whatever? So there's a connection that way. Yeah? I think perhaps also uh, you're very sensitive moment or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can uh, perceive energies around you and almost feel the thoughts or emotions or the energies around you. Yeah, well remember the emotional center, which is the, the chakra located with the belly button, that's our emotional antenna, right? And that can have varying degrees of sensitivity and it you know, that's something else we can develop because that's basically something related to the sense of telepathy. So depending on how attentive we are to this particular energy center, we can start to perceive other things in the people around us. If you've ever been in an environment where it just feels wrong, you don't feel welcome, it just feels like a bad place, that's this guy working. Okay, sometimes too you've also encountered somebody that you, you know, you've got an immediate kinship with. It just this person just feels right and you know you really enjoy being around them, that's that's this area as well. You're just perceiving those different energy vibrations, you can think of it that way. Uh, okay, so uh, that's basically the sense of intuition. Um, we'll do one of those practices today to, to help develop that, and that's something that if you're wanting to develop on your own, you can definitely uh, work with any of those practices. Um, and the big thing that we talked about is really you need that self-observation, because self-observation really allows you to separate you know, things that are generated by the ego and intellectual center versus things that come from the higher self by intuition. Yes? Um, when it comes to intuition, uh, are things like synchronicities or coincidence of, uh, around the same idea of intuition, or is that something else completely? That's a difficult one. Yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes it's not really a sense of intuition. Sometimes we're, we're put in place. Sometimes if, if I have an expression I like to use, um, if you're ready to listen, the universe will talk to you. 
and that's what a lot of synchronicities and coincidences are. Um, sometimes as well, because of the return of recurrence, we see a lot of that things happening that we kind of recognize or remember before, just because we've been in that situation before from lifetime to lifetime. But yeah, it, there could be sometimes, but usually it's a much more of a, a bigger thing than simple intuition. Uh, okay, let's uh, jump into difficult egos. Um, we've been talking a lot about the ego. Um, you're probably getting sick of listening to the talk about the ego, but that's really where we should be in phase A right now, is working with self-observation to really get to know the different egos that we have inside. Remember, the whole concept of the ego was step one was identification, step two was comprehension, and step three was elimination. Okay, step one, identification, that's why we're working with self-observation. We need to discover the different egos that, they ha that we have and basically how they work. Okay, comprehension is then take the understanding of that ego to a much deeper level. Okay, so really rig rigorously analyzing all the different effects and impulses and really starting to probe inside our subconscious for some of these hidden impulses and motives. And then once we've identified, once we fully comprehend, then we can work towards elimination. We'll talk about elimination a lot more in some of the higher classes, but we learned uh, the last class we had, one of the keys to elimination was working with alchemy, transmutation of the energies, because we can use the, the energies or the frequencies that are, that are raised in those particular activities to completely eliminate the ego. One of the first ones we'll look at, uh, the most problematic ego that we face is the ego of lust, if you look at it that way. If you talked about all the egos representing the seven deadly sins, um, which is how they appeared in the Bible, if you want to look at the story of Hercules, Hercules had to slay the seven-headed hydra, of Hercules representing the solar hero, the seven-headed hydra representing the seven main egos. We looked at each ego like being the head of a giant army. Well, this guy's like, this guy's at the top. This is the king. Okay, lust is the, the, the worst one to face. When we start facing all the individual egos, the last one standing is, is lust. If you think of this like a, for those of us that remember playing video games, this is, this is the get guy at the last level. He's the one that you really have to, to, to deal with. Um, it's very hard to eradicate this one. The ego of lust is a really difficult one to, to understand because it processes itself differently in each of the three brains. One of the reasons why this guy is so hard to deal with is because he feeds on the most powerful energy within the human organism, right? We talked about all the different centers. We said the sexual center was like the nuclear reactor that contained the most powerful energy. Of course it does. The sexual centers and the sexual energy have the power to create new life. Consequently, anybody that's feeding on that energy is going to be really strong and really powerful, and that's the problem with lust. Um, when we talk about lust, it's one of those things that, you know, if somebody says, you know, lust. You think about your own life and you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm in a monogamous relationship or whatever. I don't really have a problem with lust. I don't go out and sleep with tons of people every night. Uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't go to strip bars and, and get prostitutes. So obviously lust is something that doesn't really apply to me. But this is what we're going to look at when we think of lust. Um, one of the interesting things about this is when we look at the three brains, the motor center or the motor brain and the intellectual and the emotional, the ego of lust manifests differently in each of those three centers. In the emotional center, this is a little bit of a, a, a somewhat a disturbing thing to think about sometimes, in the emotional center for very much of humanity, lust actually manifests as the sense of love. Okay, and that's kind of a, a confusing thing sometimes. Um, for a lot of people, the, the, the love that we have for a partner or something, it's, it's a, you can kind of think of it as almost like a, a very shallow emotion. And that's why we see people, and we can all think of somebody in our own lives, that you know they're in love with somebody every month, right? They're constantly with, you know, they're, they're always with different people, or you know, they, they're in that relationship and then saying how happy they are, and then you know, a, a year later they're with somebody else, or you know, that perhaps they're, they're cheating on their significant other, or whatever. That's an example of that lower emotion and manifesting is something that we usually like to think of as being a lot more pure or a lot more spiritual, okay? For us to experience that kind of, uh, for lack of sounding corny, that kind of true love sense, that's a product of the superior emotional center and is associated with the consciousness. It's not associated with the inferior emotional center, which is really just a different manifestation of lust, okay? That's why 
you know, the person that swears love for somebody today can swear a different, or love for a different person six weeks, six months, or six years from now. It's not a lasting sort of thing because it's just a manifestation of lust. Okay, think back to when we were a teenager and love was a different person every week, right? Every time we turned around, somebody else caught our eye because that was this being really active. When we work in a partnership in alchemy, that's a way for us to transcend this lower emotion, transcend this, and build that relationship on a much more solid foundation, which is, of course, the consciousness, the spiritual side of ourselves. Um, one of the problems that we have is the ego grows stronger and stronger. That's why we see so many uh, incidences of divorce and relationship problems, because the foundation is it's this. It's not really that. Okay, and that's why when we want, if we want to experience that, that, that true love, one of the aspects that allows us to do that, to, to build that really fa strong foundation, is working not with this, but working with alchemy and developing that higher sense. Which relates to the story in the Bible about building the house on the rock versus building the house on the sand. Building the house on the sand was seen as building a relationship on lust. There's no solid foundation there. When things get a bit rocky, the foundation gives out and the house collapses. Okay? Building the house on the rock, remember the rock was the symbol for the philosopher's stone? And the philosopher's stone in alchemy was the symbol for the sex act, the sex act itself. When we build our house on the rock, which is an alchemical symbol, then no matter what happens, that's a strong foundation and the house doesn't fall down. Okay, when we build a relationship based on alchemical concepts as opposed to egoic concepts, then we have a lasting foundation and we have a, a solid relationship. In the intimate... Oh, I don't even know what that is. What is that? Oh, it looks like a little bit. I don't need to go away. Ah, there we go. In the intellectual center, it manifests as memories of love, plans and projects led to love. This is daydreaming. This is fantasizing. That's how this manifests in that particular center. Okay? And you can relate to this. Let's say you're, you know, you're driving down the road and you see an attractive person. Okay? Let's, let's use the guys as an example. Let's say you know, it's, it's the summer. We're driving up near Western University and find ourselves doing a lot of the head turning. Or, or Fanshawe College. I didn't even do anything like that. Um, what happens there is, you, you know, you see that person, it triggers this, and then the daydreaming and the fantasizing starts. Okay, or let's include the ladies and say it's in the summer and you're going by and there's a roofer standing there and he's got the shingles and he's all sweaty and glistening and all that kind of stuff. Same idea, right? You see the person, that triggers that, that visual image triggers that, and then the intellectual process takes over. For many people, this is a very visual thing. Okay, it's usually triggered by some sort of visual symbol, and of course advertisers and marketers know this, which is why, fortunately for them, we're surrounded by these symbols. Okay, that's the, obviously the attraction of pornography as well. It's a very visual thing that triggers this particular ego, being of course a very powerful ego that's capable of enslaving us in many different ways. Okay, so people who spend a lot of time daydreaming, fantasizing, planning, thinking, uh, Reliving memories of the past related to people and romantic encounters and relationships. That's lust manifesting in the intellectual center. So you can see here, we haven't even, we're not even talking about, you know, sex and weird deviant sex things, which most people associate with this. We're talking about things that everybody does almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you look at something like this, it's easy to say, I don't have a problem with that ego because I'm in a monogamous relationship. Or I don't have any kind of weird, you know, whatever. I just don't kind of a normal person. But when you look at these aspects, you can start to see that these are different manifestations. Remember, we've used this uh, phrase before, one of the biggest tricks the devil played on humanity was convincing them that he never existed in the first place. That's the best thing about the egos, as far as they're concerned, is they're always operating at a subconscious level. We don't even perceive them. So we look at this and we go, nah, not me. Maybe you guys, but not me. But then you look at these two points and you go, wait a minute. This is almost a daily basis that's happening here. So we can regularly see the manifestation of this. When we look to the third brain, when we look to the, the motor instinctive sexual center, that's where we see what most people associate as lust. We see the actual animal passions. This is where we start seeing you know, relationship to the actual act itself, eroticism, uh, you know, pornography, animal passion, all that kind of stuff lives down there. So most people can equate that to lust, but don't really think about these two things. When they're all just manifestations of the same ego in different centers throughout the body. 
The problem with the ego of lust is it wastes a lot of energy. We feed that all the time. We're constantly feeding that uh, more and more as time goes on, as we see more and more levels of degeneration in our society as a whole due to the various egos. Of course, the biggest energy waster from lust is, of course, the sexual energies. Okay, remember one of the, the reasons why we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Remember the forbidden fruit in the first place that we tasted was the sexual energies. And because of the ego of lust, we constantly waste those energies, and as a result, don't develop the solar bodies. We don't develop the golden bodies, the vehicles that we need to access in the higher dimensions. So as far as our development goes, we're stuck at this point. We're not able to ascend and transcend into higher dimensions of existence or consciousness because we're trapped at this physical level. Why are we trapped at this physical level? Is because we don't possess the energy to go any higher. Why don't we possess the energies? Because we keep losing them. Okay, and that was the whole uh, concept of alchemy, right? Turning the lead into gold, transcending the, the energies that we have now in a lower form and raising those energies to a much higher octave, making the lead turn to gold, the base metal turn into something much more uh, advanced. Yes? If we have a lot of karma in, in a lifetime, if we accumulate a lot of karma, yep. and we want to uh, negate that karma, uh, would uh, this method be the alchemy, be the method to negate it? When we look at karma, to, to make it even more, uh, um, so I'm looking for it, even a better description of what you said, we need to eliminate the ego, because it's the ego that's accrued the karma. So if in part of one lifetime, let's say the early part of one's life, mm -hmm. uh, one has accumulated a lot of karma, mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying this is true for myself, but in general, mm -hmm. uh, or from previous lifetimes, yep. uh, and we want to, in the same, in one lifetime, wipe the slate clean, get rid of it all, mm -hmm. Is it possible to do so uh, yes. in one lifetime? Yes. Which is. is eliminating the ego. And an important aspect of eliminating the ego is working with alchemy. Okay, okay. so the alchemical process is the means by which you can basically get rid of all of it. Yeah, but remember, we need the three factors. We need the birth, the death, and the sacrifice. So it's no, and this is a problem. If you go, this is why we spend so much time talking about the ego, and this is why when you look at Master Samael's uh, lifespan and what he wrote about, in the early days he wrote a little bit about the ego and a lot about alchemy, and then right before the end of his life, he dropped everything else and just went, ego, 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 and almost everything he wrote was about the ego. Because you can work in alchemy. Let's say you and your wife are focusing solely on alchemy, but you're not focusing on death of the ego. What happens is then you'd be raising energies and awakening faculties and powers and all kinds of stuff, but what would use those faculties and powers? The ego. Okay? And that's where we start seeing, uh, as an extreme example, that was uh, what uh, Adolf Hitler was. He was somebody that was working on the path, had developed all kinds of powers and abilities, but it was the dark side of him that used that. So he was basically straight off the path. That's why the alchemy has to be paired with the ego, because it's the death of the ego that allows the consciousness to manifest. And then the consciousness can make use of those energies. As far as eliminating karma is concerned, the karma is actually attracted to the ego, because it's the ego that generated the action, so the universe is reflecting back that karma to the ego. By eliminating the ego, we then eliminate the karma. That's why they say, for the unworthy, all doors are closed except one, and that of repentance. If we look at repentance from a biblical sense, repentance would basically be the elimination of ego. Remember, we can substitute ego and sin in the Christian Bible to get the, basic, the same basic concept. Yeah. And so the ego utilize, utilizes for its existence the physical body yes. and, and, and the, the, the energies, senses, the energies, the energies in the physical, of the physical body, yeah. body, and namely the five senses. Yes. So if one is to bypass, is one is to see the you, if one is to understand that the five senses are all illusion and repudiate the five senses. What is seen through the five senses, like where you're going with then that. one eliminates the ego. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. That's one of the key things to, to being able to do that. Is, yeah. Because so, then to eliminate that is to finally open our eyes and to see the truth. To and see while the, truth. the ego is manifested, the ego is what's giving us this illusion. We're going to look at this in a couple of classes. We've got a class coming up called Transformation of the Impressions. And basically, what that summarizing what that class is about is everything you see before you isn't real and it's been generated by the ego. It's all an illusion. Right? And that's why somebody can't tell us reality, they have to perceive reality. Because once we eliminate the ego, we're then able to perceive reality as it really is. Hmm. Yes? You could say, and um, grace will set you free. What's your definition of grace? Uh, grace would be basically the manifestation of the higher self. Okay. Okay. 
okay, you look at the, you know, the, what, what is the grace of God? You can look at this little part of energy from God. What is that that we carry that's a part of the higher self or the sort of that's a part of the whole? The higher self, the, the essence. Okay, it's by the essence that we get set free. The essence, in that case, would represent the grace of God, the part of the energy that we have of the cosmic whole, if you want to use the definition without saying God and grace and that kind of thing. Yes? So you're saying basically that there's self-observation mm-hmm. as one way to get rid of the egos, and alchemy as one Self-observation way. won't get rid of the egos. Self-observation allows us to identify the egos. So what other than uh, alchemy or sexual alchemy mm-hmm. uh, would get rid of it? Uh, is the, that the only way? That's basically the only way, but it's it's the energies associated with, with alchemy. It's not that we have to be actively engaged in alchemy in a relationship to eliminate the ego. We have to work with the energies that are associated with alchemy, which we're going to look at in a couple of weeks. Okay. So there is no other way, and that isn't it almost a little too easy and fun almost to get rid of the egos and then you get rid of there, the there's, karma. There's nothing easy about it. Though. Say like Hitler in his reincarnation can get rid of his uh, karma through that. Like isn't I don't know. Maybe I'm just failing to reach. Yeah, the process of eliminating the ego is it's not it's not a simple process. Okay, because of the base the power behind the ego, and that's one of the things that you learn is through self observation is just how much of everything that we do is related to the ego. Remember, we're basically 95% ego, 5% consciousness. The tails, the tails, the scales are tipped so heavily in favor of the ego. When you start trying to fight that ego, you're basically it, it's 95% strong. You're 5% strong. It takes a lot of work to tip the scales in your favor. So it's basically the two polarities of sex that we're talking about: lust and then the higher. Yeah. So yeah. The yeah, you've got the inferior emotional center, which is basically a, a tool of the ego, and you've got the superior emotional center, which is a tool of the consciousness. So those are not so much two polarities, but two different levels, if you look at it that way. One relates to the ego, and one relates to, to the higher self consciousness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this ego has enormous control over people, enslaving them with impulsive desires. There's so much that we do that's a result of various manifestations of this. It operates so fast, it's so powerful, it operates at such a deep level, we're barely aware of it most of the time. But there has been billions poured into research and study of this because by manipulating that, um, it's a tool for advertisers and marketers to basically make us buy things. They've known that since the 50s, believe it or not. And that's why we see so much of this imagery surrounding us. That's just the way it is. Uh, if you're feeding lust, you will always be enslaved by the eagles. Okay, that's if you're if you're feeding the general of the army, then you're going to have a really strong army, right? You look at it that way. So that's why this one is, is one that we really have to, to learn to identify, and it's uh, one of the more problematic ones, okay, for many people. Uh, and consequently, as we mentioned earlier, it's used by marketers and advertisers. We've all heard the expression sex sells. It's, it's true. It's why? Because this happens on such a deep level. We're barely aware of what's happening, okay? But many people, there's all kinds of different aspects of their lives that are ruled by this particular ego. They're just not aware of it. And it's the one that's the easiest to write off because you hear lust and you go, no, no, not me. I mean, maybe when I was a teenager or something, or maybe after a couple of drinks or whatever, but you know, most of the time it's not me. It's actually the exact opposite. Most of the time, this is pulling all kinds of different you know, strings. If we look at the um, analogy of us being the puppet and the egos being the puppet master, this is a string that we're regularly dancing to. Uh, fear is another difficult ego that we'll look at. Uh, fear is interesting because fear is a very paralyzing ego. Fear, in many cases, is something the ego uses to prevent us from attaining something, prevent us from, from going somewhere. Fear ends up being a very, very paralyzing ego. Many people are stuck at a certain point in their lives and can't progress any further because of fear. It has many different aspects that need to be observed in the different centers. Fear is like lust that way. It's easy, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man, I'm not afraid of anything, of course not. But when you look a lot farther, you discover that fear is responsible for all kinds of different things in our lives. 
For example, fear manifests as a worry in the intellectual center. You know, I'm a, I'm a man, I'm a tough guy, I'm not afraid of nothing, but you know what, I spend a hell of a lot of time worrying about things. Okay, that's a manifestation of fear. Fear doesn't mean running away screaming. It can manifest as worries in the intellectual center. Fear can manifest as all kinds of different physical motions in the motor center. Okay, what is the biggest fears? What is the largest fear that we collectively share as a humanity? Death. Yeah, death. What is death? It's a form of attachment. Attachment to what? This physical body, this material world. We know this physical body is not going to last, right? We know this physical world is just fleeting. Yet the biggest fear that we have is the fear of death, and death just represents an attachment to everything around us. Okay? And remember that everything around us is simply an illusion that's generated by the ego. So death is nothing than a fear of losing the illusion in front of us. Okay? It's a literally, a, and that's why we see fear cropping up when we look at practices and meditations. That's why it's not unusual in a meditation or an astral projection when things start to work that fear is generated. Because we don't want to lose this illusion. Okay? We don't want to, we don't want to lose this illusion. We're so attached to the physical world. It has many different manifestations. So we can everything from worries, different anxieties, nervousness. Phobias are really strange. Okay? One of the, after death, the next biggest thing that humanity fears is public speaking. Public speaking makes people throw up, makes their heart beat fast, makes them sweat, makes, basically people stress about public speaking. Like, it's huge. It Why? They wish they were dead. <laughs> it makes them wish they were dead. You see all kinds of strange reactions. Remembering that the egos that we carry, they're all just, I'm going to call them perversions of the instincts that we see in the animal kingdom. Okay, remember that when we looked at the, the uh, uh, Wheel of Samsara, the transmigration of souls, we went from mineral to plant to animal and then to human. Now, animals have some very specific instincts. Animals have, obviously, the, the will to procreate, to continue the species. When that ended up in the hands of the ego, it became lust. Animals have that fight or flight response. If you corner an animal, it'll try to run away, it'll try to defend itself. When we bring that into humanity, we see fear. Okay? That, when you have to pu you know, do public speaking, that heart rate and that nausea that you feel is because of the adrenaline that's been dumped in your body. The adrenaline, because in the animal kingdom, that meant you have to fight for your life. But you're just talking to a group of people. It's not a life or death situation. So the ego of fear is basically a misdirection of the instincts from the animal kingdom. Yeah? Couldn't that also, or wouldn't that also be a repercussion of something that happened in your life? Some kind of trauma or multiple traumas you have that yes, um, made you have a reaction and maybe it's subconscious that you're that afraid of being, uh, I don't know, a small space or being Yeah, that's, that's definitely possible. It's quite common, mm -hmm. too, I think. Yeah, based on experiences you've had and negative things that have you. It, not even, it doesn't, we don't even have to go back into past lives, we can just go back into our childhood. Oh, yeah. yeah, but it, obviously it can extend much farther to experiences that we've had in past lives as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's difficulty in social situations. It was all kinds of different things associated with fear. We don't have to think of fear as crying and running away. There's all kinds of different manifestations of fear. You know, sitting and waiting for a job review, and you're nervously tapping your fingers and biting your nails, and your palms are sweating, and you're getting all sweaty, and your heart rate's increasing. That's fear. Okay, that's f the fight or flight syndrome. That's your body reacting as if it needed to fight for its life in a situation that doesn't warrant that, re warrant that reaction. But is there a lot of energy coursing through your body, and where's that energy going? You're feeding that ego of fear. The more you feed that, the stronger it gets, the stronger it gets, the more control it exerts. Okay? Many people are held back and miss out on all kinds of opportunities. I have somebody that's really close to me that has missed out on all kinds of opportunities in life because of this. They can't get past this, and they're basically an impasse in their life. And their quality of life is at a, a, is a point that's much less than it should be because they have all kinds of phobias and fears, okay? Because that's how powerful this ego can actually be. In the extreme case of that would be panic attacks. Absolutely. Yeah, and we're seeing a, a, a huge increase in the amount of... Um, uh, prescription drugs that are dealing with anxiety and panic disorders, which of course are both related to fear, the inability to control those. And that has panic attacks. Uh, I know someone 
who suffers from it, it has huge uh, incidences on the physiology of the person. Mm -hmm. They feel as though they're going to have a heart attack. Yep. Literally. Yeah, and it can be triggered for some cases, I don't even know why they're triggered. It can almost come spontaneously, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And once again, that's something that's related to, to, to fear. In many aspects, uh, when you look at fear from a different anger, especially, uh, sorry, not a different anger, a different angle, uh, when we go back and we look at fear, uh, many times we can find that it's related to the concept of pride, that concept of self-image. Remember we had that whole this discussion about how we like to place ourselves on that pedestal if we're guilty of worshipping any golden idols, it's the golden idol of the self, and we cling to that image. Anytime something comes up that doesn't match that image, we're either reacting with fear or reacting with anger. Okay, so feeling self-conscious, feeling rejected, not being accepted, afraid of how others see us, many times that can be a result of fear. Remember the whole point of self-observation is to look at the ego like an onion and you start peeling back the different layers to see what lies behind. Okay, so imagine if you're, you know, if we go back to our uh, teenage days and we all had somebody that, uh, that, we, that we really liked and we really wanted to, to, to ask out, but we were always afraid. Well, what was the fear that was there? It's not life or death, but it's related to fear of self-image, fear of rejection, not being accepted, that kind of thing. In the animal kingdom, as we mentioned, as an instinct, fear serves a purpose, self-preservation. It says when the, you know, the big thing with the sharp teeth comes running at us, we should probably run away as fast as we can. But in people, it gets distorted into many complex aspects. We have to use self-observation to see how this manifests in our lives, because it holds us back. And as we looked at earlier when we talked about meditation, it not only holds us back in our physical existence, it can start holding us back on this path. Okay, many times when we are successful in an astral projection exercise, we react with fear. Many times when we're meditating, we start to achieve those high states of consciousness, we can react with fear. Fear is basically a tool the ego uses to keep us trapped in the physical body. As we go through our day-to-day -day activities working with self-observation, try to spot as many different aspects of this ego that you can. The more you observe and uncover, the more you will free yourself from the control this ego exerts. Remember, the problem is some of these things are happening on so many subconscious levels, we need to bring the subconscious into the consciousness. We want to illuminate the subconscious with the light of the consciousness, because that allows us to gain control over these various egos. Okay, going in there and basically psychoanalyzing yourself to understand what's happening in the subconscious, understand where these things are coming from. Okay, so try to see how much fear influences your decisions, what you think, what you say, and what you do. Yes? I have a question. You said in many aspects fear is related to pride, self image, feeling, mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, what if a person, say, I don't know, just a random example, has suffered a lot of trauma in a specific uh, aspect of their life, say, I don't know, heights, or people, mm -hmm. or anything, and then it has nothing really to do with their self-image or rejection or something like that, does it really have something to do with the ego or is it something that's just kind of like a scar inside them? Because well, then you can't really deal with it, with this uh, prescription. Yeah, the, the, if you look at it as a scar, the scar is something that's created by the ego. It's there, like if you pick up a scar in your body, it's a reaction to a res response. So a scar tissue is built up because of a reaction to an injury, right? The egos that we have are built up as a reaction to our environment. Yes? Okay, then let's say a little kid's bitten by a dog a uh, hundred times when they're growing up. <laughs> And then as a teenager, an even bigger dog comes and keeps biting them. Mm -hmm. So when you're like in your 30s, you see this uh, huge pit bull coming towards you. Wouldn't you be afraid of that? Is that really something to do with your ego or to do with your experiences as a... It's a, a little bit of both. It's related with the experiences, but let's say that... Would you go and pet the pit bull? Well, you wouldn't go and pet the pit bull. Exactly. But let's say that there are people that won't go out of their house because of the dogs on the street, as an example. That represents an extreme. So that's somebody that's basically trapped in a space because of their response to their environment. Okay, their environment has molded them. Remember, the eagles are simply reactions. 
Okay? Uh, it's funny the way you're describing, because my mother, actually, ha that happened to her. When my mother was a small child, she was bitten by a dog. Now she's mortified of dogs, to the point that if the dog comes, she can't move. If there's a big dog coming towards her and near her, she literally can't walk. She can't move. She's like terrified and frozen to the spot. That's a reaction. That's an ego. Okay? It's also a trauma. It's also a trauma, but trauma and ego, many times you can use them interchangeably. Okay? No, obviously that if we're, you know, been bitten by a pit bull, that you know we're not going to go over and find pit bulls and poke them with a stick. That would be a really bad idea. That's not really related to the ego. But that response of seeing a dog is going to generate something inside us. What it generates is a fear, okay? Fear is simply a reaction to something in our environment, okay? Yes, if we're, uh, uh, you know, if there's a, a, a pit bull running towards us, it's probably a time to get the heck out of the way. It's not a time to stand there and go, I'm not afraid of you, I'm not afraid of you, because you're probably going to get bitten again, okay? There's some common sense behind that. But, for example, um, Let's let's use uh, let's use snakes and spiders because I know there's two people in, in my life that uh, one of them is snakes and one of them is spiders. The one with the snakes is anything that looks like a snake. A snake on TV, she loses it. You know, a wire hanging out from behind a wall that's kind of snake-like, she has a problem with. Okay, that's an extreme reaction to. There's no poisonous snakes in Canada. Like really, if you see a snake in Canada, it's probably not. If you're in Australia, it's a different story because everything got was poisonous, right? But that's an extreme reaction to something in our environment. Why does she keep reacting like that? Because that ego is so strong and has planted all these triggers that she will respond to with that fear, which then feeds the ego because it generates all the emotions and all the energy that the ego sustains itself with. Yeah? Uh, for example, if, if someone's dreaming, um, and in their dream they're afraid of spiders, mm -hmm. but in, in real life they're not, uh, what do you think what that would uh, mean as an example? Uh -huh. Like the uh, being scared of something that you aren't scared of uh, in, in a, I don't know, it's, it's yeah, that's, that, that's a difficult one. I mean, uh, for most adults that are, you know, have reason to control of fear, there's not too many things that you're usually afraid of during the day, but that's something that can manifest a lot at night. You can see a lot of different things that generate fear at night, and we associate those experiences with nightmares, right? It's all the same thing. It's just egos feeding on those energies. You're either feeding it during the day or you're feeding it during the night. It doesn't really matter. It's basically the same energy that's sustaining the same ego. Yeah? Just one last question about that. Okay. Um, um, say that the fear of spiders or snakes or the pit bull, how does that relate when saying many aspects fear is related to pride, self-image, feeling self-conscious, fear of rejection? That, that doesn't say everything. It's in many aspects it can be. But not when you look at something like spiders and that kind of thing, or not trauma. necessarily. Not yeah, that's not necessarily. But for for like I don't, you know, your average person usually doesn't have an unrealistic fear of spiders and snakes and that kind of stuff. So in many aspects, some of the fears that we have relate more to those sort of things, more of the elevated sense of pride. But not always. There's always exceptions to everything, right? For sure. Yeah. When you have this person who's afraid of snakes, mm -hmm. and it seems. I don't know if it started in this life, but could it not have started in another life? And could this person not be regressed and have yeah. it taken from the, well, to realize exactly why they are scared and there's no need to be scared anymore? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and basically they would say facing the fear because to face your fear is to understand it. Mm -hmm. And of course, comprehension leads to elimination. To face your fear and, and regress and all that kind of stuff. That's just the, the psychoanalysis version of looking at elimination of the ego. Realizing that there's no need for that reaction. You no longer have to associate that connection with that ego and you basically reprogram yourself and eliminate that fear or that phobia mm -hmm. in the process. Yeah. I was thinking, going back to intuition and artifact and collective conscious, mm -hmm. since the beginning of time, not beginning of time, but of a moment it's in everything, Snakes have been always associated with destruction and creation, and they've been both feared and uh, worshipped. Mm -hmm. So I think it's almost like a, something that comes within us when we're born, almost like in the blueprints or a subconscious mind too, that they bring destruction as well, transformation and creation. Yeah, it, so when you look at snakes and spiders too, um, remember that the eagles and fears that we have are just. I use the term perversions of instincts that we had in the animal kingdom, okay? 
from the animal kingdom, spiders and snakes are poisonous, and most animals should stay away from them because no matter how big you are, they're capable of basically killing you. Okay, but when we bring that knowledge, now that those essences have evolved, undergone the process of evolution into a higher state, and they're human, we've carried that knowledge that we've had from their previous existences in the animal kingdom and misinterpreted it, misconstrued it. We no longer have the reason that can say, well, we're in Canada, there are no poisonous snakes. When we're all, you know, coming from the middle of Africa, yes, there are many poisonous snakes there and poisonous spiders, but that's kind of almost ingrained in our subconscious at such a deep level that we're not able to, to bring it up to a different level of consciousness and realize that it doesn't have to exist anymore. I mean, that way. Uh, watch for manifestations in your dreams as well, which is what you were talking about. Now, you've got eagles of fear that can exist during the day. You've also got manifestations uh, at night as well. Same thing with ego of lust. You've got it manifesting during the day, but you can also see that manifesting during the night too. Uh, that brings us to anger, and anger uh, has many causes. There's all different things that can that can relate to anger. It's a really strange one. Um, fear can cause anger, and guilt can cause anger, jealousy can cause anger, frustration, impatience, self-importance. Anger is interesting because it's often the result of many different egos. Okay, anger is almost the manifestation of a lot of these different things. Okay, anger is a physical manifestation and emotion that has a root cause that can actually go quite deep. Anger is very common. It's probably going to manifest in everyone here sometime in the next day or two. It's, if it didn't already manifest today, depending on how your day went. Okay, anger is something that, that we see um, it's surrounding us. It's everywhere. Uh, we have to be alert and watch for it. Not just the large outbursts, but more importantly, the little manifestations such as irritability. Remember my silly waiting in line in Walmart and the old lady with the bag of change? Okay, that was a manifestation of anger. We tend to think of anger as people who are violent and starting fights and punching and screaming. That's not always the case. Some people respond like that, but most people don't. Probably nobody in this room responds that way, but there's different ways we respond with anger. Uh, anger is a destructive ego. We need to understand it well. We need to really understand what's going on here. One of the hard things about anger is Associated with the sense of anger is the sense of feeling right and just. So consequently, it's really easy for aspects of this ego to go unnoticed. We have that sense of self-importance that we carry around with us. When we feel anger, it's usually because we feel wrong. We feel that I am right and you are wrong. So whether it's that I'm waiting in line and you're not supposed to pay with a bag of pennies, you're supposed to you know, go to a bank and change that and get real money so you don't make me late for work, or whether it's somebody cuts us off in a car and or you know, slams the brakes and almost you know, rear-ends us or whatever, uh, it, it doesn't matter. We always tend to feel justified in that anger. And that's why it's really easy for this to go unnoticed, to, to really operate at that level that we're, we're not conscious, but we're still sustaining and feeding that ego nonetheless. The problem with anger is it annihilates the capacity to think and resolve problems. Anger really divorces us and disconnects us from our higher self. Okay, anger is like a wedge that's just, you know, driven quite deeply between us and our higher self, and it prevents that, that, that sense of intuition. It prevents us from being able to put things in perspective and see things how they really are. Uh, and anger is interesting because anger isn't uh, uh, something like you know, kind of uh, lust. It's a different concept in that it affects one's health. Anger obviously is related with stress, high blood pressure, and that can cause you know all kinds of physical ailments and heart problems later in life and that kind of thing. So people that don't really control anger uh, and its various manifestations, they <coughs> actually find it causing health problems, causing digestive problems, causing circulatory problems, all as a result of that. Uh, aggression is a very big aspect of anger. Aggression is behavior that results from anger. Uh, aside from obvious acts of violence, like actually lashing out and hitting someone, aggression can range to more subtle manifestations, a change in tone of voice, a change in facial expression, or a change in body language. Right? Somebody that's, you know, standing casually versus somebody that's, you know, I mean, that's just a, these are the different tools that we use to manifest this particular ego. Most normal people don't punch other people, right? Nobody in here probably gets into fights on a regular basis. Okay, but there's other ways this is manifesting through the five centers of the human machine. It's not always a physical thing. There's all kinds of different subtle ways. 
the thing to understand about aggression is aggression is often the ego's ways of forcing someone to conform to our wishes, which brings account or sorry, which brings across uh, many karmic consequences. Aggression is how we use, uh, or sorry, how we make other people do what we want. Okay, if you look at it that way, aggression is uh, an outwards manifestation of anger, which is the ego uh, using that to basically control other people around us. Okay, basically us exerting our will on the rest of humanity. The problem is, is that will isn't coming from the higher self, that will is coming from the ego. So it's a way that we make other people do what we want. Okay, and of course, that brings many karmic consequences, because that's how we end up uh, uh, influencing the lives of those around us. And if it's a, a, an action impelled by ill will, an action impelled by the ego, then more often than not, it brings karmic consequences our way. Excuse me, if yes. you say something in response to someone, mm -hmm. and you're not hold, holding them any ill will, mm -hmm. really, I, I was always told you can't be a doormat unless you first lie down. Can you not stand up for yourself and say, well, no, this is such and such, mm -hmm. but no, no, no ill will feeling, this mm -hmm. is what I believe. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just so would you, con would you consider that anger or no. what? No, just because you're standing. Remember that when we look at um, even the concept of you know being passive. Remember when we talk about being passive, we talk about that as a manifestation of the consciousness, not being a doormat. Um, and I've used this analogy before and a couple of times, and it's a, a good time to bring this one back. Remember the story of, of Buddha sitting under the, the, the yeah. bow tree meditating, and that person comes by and starts you know yelling all those insults at him, and you look at you stupid sitting under the tree meditating, you look like an idiot. And Buddha didn't lie down and take it. Buddha simply said. Uh, what do you do with someone that gives you a gift that you don't want? And the guy that was making fun of him says, well, you just tell him to take it back. And Buddha said, well, take your gift and leave. That wasn't a manifest. He didn't just lay there and take it. It wasn't a manifestation of anger either. He was just choosing not to receive that energy. So in that way, he was being passive, passive basically responding to that with the consciousness, not responding with, with, with anger, which comes from the ego. Another thing that really uh, can confuse the issue as well, um, because the egos are operating in a much higher dimension, people's egos, this gets really interesting, are actually able to communicate with each other. So if you and I are engaged in an argument, our, the two egos of anger that we have are basically both working together to elevate the situation. Because the more heated it becomes, the more energy that's expended, the more they're actually sustaining themselves. Okay, so that's why it's important for us to, to break that pattern by trying to respond with the consciousness. So let's say we're with our significant other and we're in an argument, rather than fighting back and just reacting, almost what you described, choosing your words carefully, trying to self-observe, trying to maintain that observer and observe. I'm not going to take this because this person very well might be wrong about something. Mm -hmm. Try to get the argument across, but not meet it head on. Now, one of the best tips to do that um, if you can think of you know, anger as, as a, something that's coming toward you, it's almost like wait until that energy is expended, and then when it starts to swing the other way, that's when you introduce your point of view. Almost like pushing somebody on a swing, you wait till they've got to the highest and they're out of that energy, then you introduce a little push, which swings it even farther the other side. It's all about choosing what to say and when to say it. But the key is to not identify with the emotion and react. That doesn't mean the same thing as lie there and take it. Do you find that this particular ego is really becoming prevalent in our society, and I have a couple of specific examples, and one of them is, if you look at political debate nowadays, it's particularly in a place like the United States, where basically they're so polarized, they're just yelling at each other, Yeah. and I mean, there's no compromise, there's no sort of listening and saying, hey, maybe this guy's got a good point about this, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the other one that I think about all the time now is all of the internet uh, discourse that goes on, whether it be uh, some, uh, you know, and blogs troubles, and comments and things like and that, and, and yeah. Yeah. like, I have a friend who works at the London Free Press, and he was telling me that if you go in and look at the news stories online, you're allowed to put in whatever yeah. comments you want. I do that on my lunch hours at form of the anger, the anger in the comments is stunning. Yeah, people looking looking for outlets of this to feed and sustain those egos. And yeah, they don't have to run around punching people. There's all kinds of outlets for that. And Remember, when we look at society as a whole, as, as times go on, we're seeing more and more involution, more and more degeneration, as these things as lust, anger, fear, depression, all this stuff is basically growing. The example I have is um, that of uh, Jesus in the temple with the money lenders. Yep. 
um, where Jesus expressed anger. Mm -hmm. um, now, but what was that an analogy for? Well, the temple was the physical body. Mm -hmm. The merchants were the ego. Okay, so that so example, that anger was towards the ego. Yeah, and that anger was a, basically a representation of force, showing us that we have to be active and forceful in eliminating the ego. It's not something that's going to happen of its own accord. We've got to basically go in there and fight. Remember when we talk about the ego, we, we use a lot of analogies like fight, and war, and battle. and you know, I mean, even the term revolutionary psychology, the idea of a revolution and a coup and overthrowing the powers that exist, that's reinforced in that story of, of Jesus throwing that, the lenders out of the temple. This, this is the temple, and the lenders represent basically the egos that we care. So anger is only righteous when it's directed towards the egos. I like that. Yeah, when it's when it's serving the will of the higher self. Look at it this way, you know, our Father who art in heaven, thy will be done. When we're serving the will of the higher self, then that's the ultimate just cause for everything we're doing it that way. Yeah. Well, then say, for example, uh, someone that's self-observing becomes fearful, and then they therefore become angry that they're becoming fearful. Would that still not just be feeding two egos at the yeah, same time? Yeah, you can get caught in a loop like that very easily. Yeah. And then you become frustrated because you're angry because you're, <laughs> you know, you can, yeah, these all, they, they all compound themselves for sure. And that's why it's sometimes even really hard to get down to, to that root, that, that point of origin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This brings us to a really important aspect. Um, one of the big concepts to understand when we talk about fighting the ego is something called death in motion. Okay? Uh, we have to practice what we call death in motion, dying from instant to instant. When I talk about like anger and lust and fear, you can't meet those head on. That's like the general of the army. That's like if you decided you wanted to overthrow, I don't know, uh, um, uh, who's the guy from North Korea? Kim Jong Un. Yeah, that's like you decide, okay, I'm, I'm just going to go get him. He's, he's building nuclear weapons, he's doing all kinds of stuff. I'm just going to march into, into, the, into his house and get him. What's the problem with that? you got to get through like millions of other soldiers to even have a go to be close to that guy. Okay? When we look at things like fear, anger, lust, the big ones, they're the head of the army. You can't get anywhere near them. You've got to go through all the smaller ones first. And that's what death in motion is all about. What is dying from instant to instant? What is death in motion? This is a bit of a long quote, but... Death in motion is referring to the minute manifestations that we don't pay attention to. These tiny little things which we don't even perceive as being actual defects or associated with the ego. The problem is, those little defects, those minute details that we miss, they are the food which is feeding the defect, feeding the ego itself. We're feeding it through all those minute roots. Then if we start to take them away, the ego starts to die. It starts to decay once and for all because it feeds from all of these. Therefore, the minute manifestations are the life of the ego. If we start to take them away, the result is death. When we look at the ego, and we've used this analogy before, remember I'm a really horrible artist, you remember that, right? Um, this, is a, this is a tree and these are the roots. There's one, two, three, whatever. There's seven. That's a horrible tree. We'll make it better, we'll put some... Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a tree. These seven main roots, so these are the things like, uh, there's like, say, envy, and there's anger, and there's lust, and now let's make that one gluttony, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? These are the main ones. These are the anchors <coughs> that hold the tree in the ground and give it a solid foundation. Okay? These big roots, they don't actually gather any water or nutrients. We know from the structure of a tree, off of these roots are other big roots, right? That come down here. And off of those roots are even smaller roots. And off of those roots are even smaller roots. And off of those really small roots are little tiny roots. And off of those little tiny roots are even smaller tiny roots. And off of those are little weeny ones. It's these little tiny root hairs that actually gather the nutrients and the water from the soil. Okay? Those little tiny root hairs they represent the minute details. Okay? Let's say we have a problem, I have a problem with anger. Okay? 
there's no point waiting until I really lose my temper to try to deal with the problem of anger. Once I've really lost my temper, it's too late. It's too powerful. I can't control that. But in my day-to-day -day activities, because of maybe I only lose my temper once every couple of months, but in my day-to-day -day activities, there's all these tiny details, there's all these tiny manifestations of anger. Things like impatience in that lineup at Walmart. Things like frustration because somebody turned against a red light. Those represent the tiny roots. They're the ones that we deal with. You can't go after the, 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 the head general of the army. You've got to go sneak around and be like a sniper and get all those soldiers one at a time. If you run headstrong into an army of 10,000 people, uh, unless it's a Hollywood movie, you don't have a chance whatsoever. But if you can crawl around in the dark and fight one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to be stronger than all the individual soldiers. Okay? Death in motion is all about self-observation and catching the tiny manifestations. The ones that are easy. You're standing in the lineup at Walmart, somebody pulls out a bag of change, it's really easy to feel that reaction and go, no, I'm not bothered by that. I don't need to react to that. Okay? Every time you catch something little, every time you catch somebody that, that you know, turns against a red light, remember that maybe they just found out that their wife's giving birth and they're rushing to the hospital. Maybe they just found out their child's been injured and they're rushing home from work. That's fine, I'm not going to react to that. Every time you do that, you slowly start to take these roots away. And what happens when you take those roots away? Well, this root now can't get any food and water, so that starts to wither which causes that to wither, which causes that to wither and dry, which eventually takes out that big one. Okay? That's the key to understanding fighting the ego. You can't go after lust head to head, but you can go after all those tiny manifestations. Okay? Things like you know, seeing somebody on the street and letting them catch your eye, or, opening a, or going to the, uh, one of my famous examples to, to work with this, because it's a really funny one, standing in the lineup at a grocery store and you've got all those magazines out the side of you, okay? Little manifestations that you can choose not to react to, okay? Those are what you have to look for, the tiny examples in day-to-day -day life, okay? Not the big ones. You'll never take these on. They're too big, they're too strong, they're too far embedded in our psychology, and they're just too powerful. You instead go for the day-to-day -day manifestations and make the tree die from the bottom up. As you start to take away the food, these big ones become weaker and weaker until eventually the whole tree topples. Yes? And this is exactly uh, what I'm, I'm doing in this Course in Miracles that was supposedly uh, mm -hmm. um, the Jesus? dictated by Jesus, yeah. where he talks about in the, in the workbook for students. Uh, and this I'm doing, we just started it. There's 365 days of the year, I'm just on day five because it's starting on New Year's Day. So uh, basically everything you see, just take a few moments, and it's not supposed to be painful or ritualistic, but just take a few moments each day and say, for example, that mar magic marker isn't real. That magic marker doesn't exist. It's not what I think it is. Mm -hmm. Or and just like that, just uh, little things. Little details. Yeah. Just little details that um, that pencil, that body, say a person, that body is not what I think it is. That body is not real. It just anything, mm -hmm. like things like that. And the thought I'm having right now, the thought of anger, um, does not exist. Or well, the thought this makes me angry because this is an illusion. These 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 types of phrases mm -hmm. uh, each day just these small little things as you say are the little roots that can talk yeah. to the tree. And and that's the key, it's it's to understand little things, but the danger that exists in looking at our psychology is to miss this aspect. Okay, the whole concept of dying in motion, because there's tons of little things that we do throughout the day that are manifestations of much larger things. Okay, those are the ones that you start with. You're never going to be able to stop a huge outburst of anger. You might have had one and tried, I'm going to try to self-observe, I'm going to try to self-observe. This is impossible, I'm still angry. Okay, you might find yourself in a situation like this where you're trying to self-observe, trying to self-observe, but ah, you know, it's not working, or you know, something lately, gluttony, or envy, or something like that. Okay? But it's the day-to-day -day manifestations. If you know anyone that's ever had a problem with alcohol, one of the things they, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they take it one day at a time. Okay? You gotta start with small, you can't just cut it off, but you start small, catching those small details on a day-to-day -day basis, and as time goes on, you become stronger and stronger. That's key to death in motion. Okay? The ego dying isn't just something that we can you know, say for at some point down the road or at some point when we find a situation that allows us to work in alchemy or whatever, we can start that now with all the day-to-day -day activities that we do. 
Because if we're paying attention, if we're self-observing, we can find all kinds of tiny manifestations that are really easy to deal with. They're really easy to control. It's not hard to not lose your temper because somebody cuts in front of you as you're driving. Your reaction is to get angry, but you can say, hey, nothing happened. I didn't get in an accident. There's obviously something going on in their life. You know, me, some, I probably cut somebody off and not noticed either. No big deal. On with my day. It's really easy to do that. <coughs> and that's where we have to start. Yes? Well, what if the person has a problem with anger or anxiety or fear or something? Mm -hmm. And then say they're taking medication and they're not, or they're drinking for that, or they're taking some kind of drug to cope with it. Mm -hmm. If you cut that back, wouldn't it just transfer the problem into another escape? And then into another escape? And then even if they take prescriptions for it, isn't, isn't that an escape itself? Uh, the prescription stuff, I, yeah, I don't know. Like if somebody has some sort of a chemical imbalance, I have no idea. Or then forget prescription, but say uh, escapes in general. Well, escapes in general, like if you're looking at, uh, let's like talk recreational drugs, alcohol, and that kind of stuff. Is uh, it talking like sure. addictions? Or, or even getting angry and exploding at someone can be an escape in your mind. Mm -hmm. Like it releases certain chemicals that you get addicted to. Because it's no. just feeding egos that are becoming stronger. Yeah, it's you got to start with the small things. Wouldn't it switch just from scape to scape? Mm -hmm. Like, wouldn't you have to fix the root of the problem in order to get rid of all of the? But to get to the root of the problem, you're going to have to get all those different things that you're. You're going to have to remove all those things that you keep switching to, and that's the really the, the key to understanding this. Because you're right in that sense that if you if you don't kill the root from the bottom up, then you're just moving, you're just displacing things but the problems are still there. That's why you have to catch all those minute manifestations, the small things that eventually will lead to the root. You can't go, you can't go right for the throat straight away because it's too strong. Remember the whole balance, 95% consciousness, 5% ego, or sorry, not the other way around, 5% ego, 5% consciousness. We're so weak <coughs> that you can't fight that. But you can fight all those small one-on-one -on -one battles day to day. Do it one day at a time, and eventually over time, you see huge changes. So maybe in the early stages, yeah, you're just moving one thing to the other and you're just finding different outlets. But over time, you start to narrow that down. Those outlets become fewer and fewer until eventually you reach the root. You look at it that it's way. It's almost like having five bottles and four cups. You're just switching, trying to like put the lid on all of them at the same time. But there's always going to be one open where the problem is still. Mm, but if you're working with self-observation, if you're doing it this way, you're, you're eliminating the bottles one by one. And eventually there's a time when you have four caps in one bottle. And now it's to your advantage. But yeah, in the beginning, this is a hard thing to do. This is, this is a challenge. Because, and this is the part that's really creepy to think about, the egos are intelligent entities. They will know that you're trying to do this. Okay, so the more you fight, the more they fight back. Okay, they're very cunning and crafty that way. And they'll know that you're trying to do this. That's why you have to start with the small things. You want them to sneak around in the dark like a sniper, taking out one after the other, not making your presence known and going after the general, because you just get rushed and then you go nowhere. Okay, we've got to be in, remember the quote we used before, we have to learn to be alert like a sentry in a time of war. We've got to be on guard, catching all these little things, all these small day-to-day -day activities, because the irony is the things you don't think twice about, being frustrated because the lineup at the grocery store is too long. Ironically, that's what feeds the anger, which leads to an outburst um, at some point with your significant other, which causes a problem in your relationship, or lashing out at a coworker or a friend, and causing problems there. It's these small things we don't even think about that ironically feed the larger things. We start by limiting the smaller things, then we change the larger things. And the real danger when we're looking at the, the, the Gnostic path and looking at the ego is just to, to try to meet these head on and go, it's too hard. It's just too hard. I can't control my fear. I can't control my anger. These are just too hard. I've tried and it doesn't work. I'm not strong enough. But if you look at it the other way, find all the simple things. If you have a fear of public speaking, just because you understand ego doesn't mean you can walk into a concert hall tomorrow and give a speech to a thousand people. You can say, but it's just an ego, but it's just an ego. And I can try, you can try to self-observe all you want. You're still going to be afraid. But if you catch the minor manifestations of fear in your life, and you learn to control those, eventually you reach a point where you can master the bigger ones. And eventually, it isn't in a couple of days, it isn't in a couple of weeks, it might not even be a couple of months, it might be a couple of years.
okay? We're not talking about an incident where night change. But the whole key to death in motion is just that, understanding the daily minute manifestations and learning to eliminate those. The almost inconsequential, it seems, meaningless things, yet the inconsequential, meaningless things are the ones that sustain the entire tree, the ones that feed the larger ones. The, the, the big generals of the army. So you want to go after the little foot soldiers that are really easy to get rid of, and then eventually one day we find ourselves facing the general of the army, but all his reinforcements are gone. Okay, and at that point we're both equally matched, and we have the, the physical strength to eliminate that ego entirely and make it a permanent change in our psychology. But you can't get that permanent change while you're allowing all those daily manifestations to appear. Uh, the practice we'll do tonight is, the first bit of the practice, we're going to do a retrospection exercise. And this is just a, a way to, to discover egos that have maybe manifested today. So it's kind of like self-observation uh, after the fact. To do this exercise, we meditate on the events of our day working backwards in time. So we'll start from the point that we sit down in our chair to meditate and go through our day backwards until the point that we woke up. Okay. Later on, we'll look at using a similar practice to go not to the point we woke up, but further back in our lives, all the way back to our childhood, all the way back to a baby, and then we use that as a launch pad to go back and recover memories from previous existences as well. But uh, the way we use retrospection today is just looking at our day backwards in reverse, almost like watching a movie and rewind, okay? But trying to analyze events and situations looking for manifestations of the ego, looking for things that we might have missed. This is something that you can do as part of your meditation uh, at night before you go to bed. Just look at the day and was there any manifestations of ego that we missed? Okay, because oftentimes in the heat of the moment when you're you know, in the middle of doing something, we can miss things. We can forget to self-observe. Okay, but when we look at the events of the day almost from a different point of view, not attached to them, we can often discover different egos and we can make a mental note to pay attention the next time that manifests. What were the things that triggered the ego? What were the cause and the effects? We can still learn a lot from the event after, the, sorry, after it's happened. And after we've done that for a bit, we'll work with the mantra that we looked at today, Om Masi Padme Yom. And of course, this was the one that we used to develop intuition. Okay, so we'll take a, a quick break and then we'll come back to do our practice.